something. Just give him a hand. Right? He works hard every week. That was a beautiful um, arrangement of that wonderful hymn. So welcome to our service this morning. It's great to see you all. It's great to have you guys, uh, you guys everyone who's joining us online uh, for our worship this morning. Beautiful day. Spring is here. We had 8.30 people wearing shorts outside. So, uh, so spring's here. It can't go back to any cold weather. Uh, so this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So uh, those of you who are here with us this morning, it's great to have Tala uh, leading us in our worship, uh, singing this morning, but also per the uh, governor has changed, um, opened up some restrictions. So we're still wearing masks today, but you can sing underneath your mask. And in honor of that, I'm going to bless you and have Trish turn my mic up blaring and I'm going to sing full force for you. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm going to keep it a nice service and not do that. But let us stand and join together as we sing, Hail the day that sees him rise.
pray together our opening prayer. Almighty God, through Jesus Christ, you reveal to us a power that has no parallel. May the eyes of our heart be enlightened to this power and all it has done in our lives. Pour out your spirit of power upon us that we may proclaim your glory and your grace. Amen. You may be seated. And we'll prepare our hearts for prayer as we sing, Lord, I lift your name on high. Thank you, Gary and Tala. As we prepare our hearts for prayer, we have uh, many names on our prayer list. We want to be remembering all of those who are in our, in our prayer time this morning. Also around our world, the situation and um, violence is going on in uh, uh, Israel between the Palestinians and the Israelis. So prayers for peace and a resolution to uh, the situation going on there. Um, as well as any other needs or concerns that are on our hearts. So let us pray this morning. God of power and might, highly exalted, reigning over all nations, we clap our hands with cries of joy. How awesome are you, O Lord, most high. Not only did you raise your son, Jesus, from the dead, but you also brought him to glory with you, and you seated him at your right hand, far above all rule and authority, all power and dominion, and above every name that is named not only in this age, but in the age to come. We clap our hands with cries of joy. Jesus, once a baby in his mother's arms, is not that any longer. Jesus, once a carpenter, a teacher, a companion and friend, walking the paths of the earth, is not so now. Jesus, whose healing love mercifully blessed all that he touched, all whom Jesus could see and hear and speak to is not limited any longer by time and space. Jesus, a self-giving servant who hung on a cross, pouring out the blood of love on our behalf, is not hanging on the cross now. For you raised him from the dead. and We clap our hands with cries of joy. God has ascended amidst shouts of, shouts of joy. The Lord amidst the sounding of trumpets. So we sing praises to you, our God and our King. You have brought your Son to you in glory. You've put everything under his feet and appointed him to be the head of everything. So this morning we remember Jesus' teachings, his miracles, his compassionate care. We remember his death and his awful suffering. We remember also his undaunted spirit, his love undying, his and we remember his resurrection your mighty power exerted in him as you raised him from the dead. 
The day, this Ascension Sunday, we remember his ascension. The curtain has gone up on a new act in your redemptive drama. The spirit of the ascended one has been poured out on his followers, and the church is born and is alive. You gave Jesus rule and authority and dominion. You put all things under his feet. For the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So here this morning as your church, your body, the dwelling place of the wonder of your presence, our praises soar. We, your church, Lord, the dwelling place of wonder, the wonder of your presence, your presence making us a home of grace, a redemptive fellowship. And as a home of grace, we seek to be a home for all. Through your Holy Spirit, confront us if we are not a home for all. We are your church. We pray that our church would be a fellowship of teaching and learning, a place where the gospel is preserved and shared, where faith once and for all delivered to the saints is proclaimed, where hungry souls find nourishment. Come Holy Spirit, be the fire in our hearts, be the wind in our sails, be the strength in our wills that we may stay centered in Jesus and be his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. We are your church, O Lord. We want your presence and your glory to pervade the whole creation. We will worship and serve you until the kingdoms of the world become your kingdom and you shall reign forever and ever. At this time, as Gary uh, plays for us, um, let us uh, offer in silence any concerns, any uh, concerns or prayers we have on our hearts at this time. ourselves to you and all that's on our hearts, all of those who are in our prayers to you, shall we join together as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We give thanks for all of God's blessings in our life, for this beautiful place to be able to gather with brothers and sisters in Christ. Paula's going to come and sing our offertory for us as we in our hearts offer our gifts and offerings back to God.
shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my soul Time Wade is going to come and lead our read our scripture lesson for us this morning. Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. I think I'm on a. Sorry about that. You give me the wrong. Jesus said to them, these are my words that, that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law from Moses, the prophets, in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He said to them, this is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and the change of heart and life for the forgiveness of sins must be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Look, I am sending to you what my father promised, but you are to stay in the city until you have furnished with heavenly power. He led them out as far as Bethany, where he lifted his hands and blessed them. As he blessed them, he left them, and was taken up to heaven. They worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem overwhelmed with joy, and they were continuously in the temple, praising God. Amen. Thank you, Wade. Let us stand for our, as we sing, O sons and daughters, let us sing. Hands, my feet. 
Sisi. I invite you to, uh, Chris will project the Apostles' Creed. I'd like to open with us saying together the Apostles' Creed. Let us say this together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So we said the Apostles' Creed in the, one of the statements referring to Jesus, we said, He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. What do we really know about the ascension of Jesus? Today is Ascension Sunday. The ascension was that time when Jesus visibly departed from the disciples and came into the presence of God the Father. It represented the completion of Jesus' earthly ministry. The ascension was a day of transition. It was the moment when the Jesus of earth became the Jesus of heaven. Today's uh, message is titled, A Happy Ending. May, may seem, that title might seem a little strange because think of when you've had loved ones visiting and they're getting ready to go home and say goodbye. It's usually a sad time. Now, there are probably exceptions when you're jumping for joy when they say goodbye, and, and you might be rejoicing. But most of the time, farewells are accompanied by tears and not shouts of joy. I remember when I left uh, Mississippi to move here to, to New England. At the time, I thought it was going to be temporary, but then when my wife said, I like visiting Mississippi but not living there, I knew it became more permanent, and it was a sad time to say farewell to friends and family back home. Each move as a pastor's family that we've made, this is our fourth, I think if I'm counting right, our fourth appointment. And every move that we've made, because we develop such close friendships with the people where we've been, it's a difficult and emotional time. One of the hardest things in the world is to say goodbye to those we love. With that in mind, you might suspect the story of the ascension being a rather sad time as the disciples were saying goodbye to Jesus. But J Jesus was now going away, and they would not see him again. But Luke reco records a very different story. And Jesus departed from them, and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple praising God. The question I'd like for us to focus on this morning is, what does the ascension of Jesus mean for our lives? How does Jesus' ascension impact us today? The ascension says that we can learn to depend on God without being dependent upon God. Now, if you think about that, it might be a little confusing, and you, some of you might say, well, that's heresy, and you're going to kick me out the open door there. But let me, let me explain first. In our society, we've become dependent upon others in different ways. As children, we're dependent upon our parents. We're, when we're ill and when we're sick or injured, we're dependent upon our caregivers. But if we stay in that state of dependency and never grow and move back towards health or maturity, we never grow. We have to start moving from a state of dependency if we're to grow and mature physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. What was the situation of Jesus' disciples? For three years, their every move centered on Jesus. Around his leadership, these 12 common men have become known around Israel. If they are to grow, then Jesus has to leave. If Jesus had not departed, they would have grown to be dependent upon his physical presence. Instead of struggling with great moral issues in light of what Jesus taught and what Jesus did, 
They would have just run to Jesus for all the answers. There was security in that, but there would be no growth in that. What was needed to launch them out into the world was not an unhealthy dependence upon Jesus, but rather a deep and abiding faith. As Jesus told Thomas when Thomas doubted him that he had been resurrected, he said, you have believed because you have seen, but blessed are those who have not seen, and yet they still believe. So I'm not saying we don't need God. I'm not saying we're not to look to God for guidance. But depending on God does not mean we just sit back and we wait for God to do everything for us. God, I'm going to sit back and you do it all. That's not what we're referring to here. We're supposed to be partners with God. We look to God for guidance, but we also act and think for ourselves. A healthy dependence upon God is seeking God's guidance, but it's also going ahead and making our decisions. It's also going ahead and taking action, performing a service, even if we're not 100% sure where God is leading us. We trust that God is leading, while at the same time, we're stepping out in faith and taking a risk. The ascension of Jesus says, at the heart of life, there's mystery. You know what our problem is? We all know it all. If you don't know the answer to something, what do you do? You pull out your phone and you pull up your Google app or you go to your computer and you can just search every. We've got the little round, uh, what's it called, Google, Google something that all we have to do is say, hey, Google, and ask our question. And in a few seconds, she's given us the answer to whatever we're looking for. Or we are in a world now that uh, um, we'll know within seconds of when an event's ha event happens. We know what's going on all across the world. We have immediate access to all of the information that we need. We're being robbed of the unexpected. We are continually shown statistics that tell us the likelihood of what's going to happen tomorrow or what's going to happen next. But the ascension affirms that despite what we may think, life is still a mystery. We don't know everything. I can't begin to explain how the ascension of Jesus happened. But that doesn't bother me. The disciples did not try to explain Jesus' resurrection or his ascension. They just proclaimed it. In ancient Greek dramas, there was a role called God in a, in a machine. And whenever the part of the deity's role would occur, would come, the um, man would be lowered in a box, and that, uh, that was the machine part of it. And then he would say his lines, and after he was done his lines, then he was pulled back up um, by the... Uh, no longer to be seen. And unfortunately, that's often how we see God. When we want help, when we need answers to our prayers, we ask God, we want God to come immediately, answer our prayers, solve our dilemma, and then once, once everything's done, then you can go back, God. We'll call you next time. We need you. If the resurrection and ascension of Jesus affirms anything, it's that God is not controlled by a machine. God goes up to heaven by God's own accord. God goes up so that we could grow up. We're not in control of everything in life. It's not necessary for us to have all of the answers. For in the end, our faith is more important than our knowledge. And the ascension says that God has resources for each of us that's not yet revealed. Just before Jesus departed, he told his disciples, it's for your sake that I go. For if I did not go, the comforter could not come to you. He was referring, who's, who's Jesus, we've got a quiz. Who's Jesus referring to? Who's that comforter, comforter that could not come if Jesus did not depart? Anybody? John, Holy Spirit, that's right. So the third person of the Trinity. It appeared as though Jesus was leaving his disciples to flounder around for themselves. But that's not what was happening. Jesus was leaving them with a resource that they did not know existed. We can be sure that God gives each of us resources that enable us to cope with future circumstances. I'd like to read for you a series of quotes that come from some from theologians, politicians, military leaders, economists from the first part of the 19th century. And here's some of the quotes of what some uh, people in that time said. In 1800, Bishop Barclay declined the position of Archbishop of Canterbury with these words, 
He said, I have not the strength to support a failing church. In 1801, William Wilberforce, who was very instrumental in ending slavery in England, he said, I dare not marry. The future is too uncertain. In 1806, William Pitt said, there is scarcely anything around us but ruin and despair. And in 1848, Lord Shaftesbury said, nothing can save the British Empire from shipwreck. In 1849, Ben Desrelli said, in industry, commerce, and agriculture, there is no hope. And then in 1852, the dying Duke of Wellington said, I thank God that I will be spared from seeing the consummation and ruin that is gathering about us. If that is all you knew, if these doom and gloom comments, if that's all you knew about the first part of the 19th century, you would conclude the world was on the verge of ending. Yet, during that same period that these comments were being made, the following people were being born. Abraham Lincoln, Claude Monet, Clara Barton, Andrew Carnegie, Charles Dickens, Oliver Wendell Holmes, and many other significant folks. Who is to say what resources God will place at our disposal in, to face the future? When God called Moses to lead the people of Israel out of slavery, he said, I can't do it. I have a speech impediment and nobody's going to listen to me. And God gave him Aaron as a spokesperson. Before we come to the quick judgment about some difficulty in our own lives, we should remember this point. The ascension, in a manner of speaking, makes appearing as though Jesus is leaving his disciples for good. But the fact is, God never leaves us without the inner resources to cope with the future events we'll face. The Holy Spirit was about to come into their lives. This meant that Jesus would no longer be limited as we are by time and space on earth. He could now reside in the hearts of every single believer. In the, his book, the, Through the Valley of the Kwai, Dr. Ernest Gordon, who later became uh, the chaplain at Yale, he tells the story of his experience in a Japanese POW camp during World War II. He said one day while they were marching through a town, he noticed a group of weavers who were making very colorful, intricate straw shawls. And interestingly enough, the only thing they could see during that um, weaving process or fabrication process was the back of the shawl. And it just looked like a tangled mass of colorful threads. It was only when the shawls were completed and turned around, turned over, that they could see the fullness of their creation. Life can be like that, Gordon concluded. So often the events of our lives, like the shawls, look like the, shawl, the, weave, the shawls did to the weavers, just like a tangled mass of disconnected threads. The resurrection and the ascension of Jesus may have appeared that way to the disciples, not knowing how it fit into the big picture of life. But as they looked back on the, that event, and as we look back on the events of our lives, we can see God's design in the fabric of our lives. The ascension of Jesus was part of God's design. The Apostle Paul said he ascended into heaven, and he led captivity captive. Or another way of saying it is he ascended into heaven and caused death to die. That is the design of the fabric. That's what all the tangled threads reveal. Jesus led them out to the small town of Bethany. He blessed them, and he was taken up to heaven. And the disciples, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy, a happy ending. What impact will you allow the ascension of Jesus to have on your life? Let's remember the ascension is a happy ending. May we remember that because of the ascension, Jesus is with us always, empowering us and guiding us through the indwelling of his Holy Spirit, indwelling each and every one of us. So let us pray together. This prayer is going to come up on the screen. I'd like to invite you to join me as we pray this prayer together. Oh God, you have glorified our victorious Savior with a triumphant resurrection from the dead and ascension into heaven, where he sits at your right hand. Grant, we ask you, that his triumph and glory may ever shine in our eyes or clearly through his suffering. 
and more courageously endure our own. Being assured by his example that if we endeavor to live and die like him, for the cause of your love in ourselves and others, you will raise our dead bodies again, and conforming them to his glorious body, call us above the clouds, and give us possession of your everlasting kingdom. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you, let's stand and sing together our closing, our recession, closing hymn, Because He Lives. One quick announcement I forgot to make earlier is uh, Tuesday we are having another uh, drive, outreach is doing another drive-through community dinner. So you need to place orders ahead of time. So if you can email that to MJ by tomorrow morning, uh, they'll get, um, she'll get that order in to Steve and, and uh, uh, Laurie and they'll have those ready. You can drive through, I think it's around 6 Tuesday, I don't remember exact time, but uh, you can pick those up and take them home and have a delicious a turkey dinner meal, so uh, delicious meal Tuesday. I think they've got like 
59 orders already, so it should be a good successful uh, night, Tuesday night. So great to have you with us. Those of you joining us online, I hope you have a wonderful day. And let us offer God's blessing to one another as we sing our North Side benediction. Bless you and have a wonderful week.